Um, I am Ryan Morlock. I'm with a local startup called Doctalytics. We are built on Google App Engine in Python. And so some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today is really coming from the experiences building that application, which has a lot of RESTful services consumed by an Angular JavaScript front end. But in a prior life, I worked for a large company in town called Thomson Reuters, who built a, a whole suite of applications around RESTful services to kind of decouple their architecture that had previously been very highly coupled. So a uh, quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today. What is REST? Why should you care about it if you don't already know? Um, why JSON? That's probably going to be a little bit simpler talk given that most web developers are using JSON these days. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about HTTP considerations uh, for REST. And then the main part of what I'd like to discuss is I'm going to give one example of three different ways. I'm going to de demonstrate building a very simple application uh, using raw Web App 2 and just the JSON library in Python. Uh, and see what that looks like. Then I'm going to show you how you would, what things the Google Cloud endpoints would offer you if you were to rebuild that application using their frameworks. And then finally, I'm going to finish with a library that uh, we created at Docalytics that I tentatively call ProtoPy, which is a fork of the Google uh, Proto RPC library that's specific to JSON and has some niceties uh, that's not possible when you're talking about generic uh, Proto buffers. So. Um, if you'd like to follow along in the slides, um, leveraging our Docalytics platform, I made them available at this URL, documents.morlock.net slash devfest-2015. Um, you should be able to see the slides. Uh, it won't advance in real time, but you can kind of uh, follow along. And I put that at the bottom of the other slide. All right, so what, what makes Rust different? Um, for me personally, coming to REST was really a journey coming from really a SOAP-based world. So I kind of think about it in that context, but it's really a little bit more broad than that. Um, REST stands for represent Representational State Transfer, and it's really this more general idea that the responses to the client contain all the, all the data that that client needs to use that data, or that the information and that the server isn't maintaining state between requests. So anything that the server needs to process the next request comes up as part of the request um, for, for that particular time. This goes back to older systems that might have you know, sign-on calls and the server maintains sessions and there was state on the server between sessions. And this creates a lot of problems with relating, related to scalability because you have to make sure if, you're, if you have a large bank of servers that you're getting the next request from that user back to the original server that processed the previous request to make sure that the state is there. Or you have to have some sort of way of communicating that state between different servers that you're using. So REST was kind of a, a departure from that. It's really an approach more than a standard. Um, SOAP is a standard, defined the standard package format in XML and uh, WSL for defining how those services, the endpoints that are available on the service. REST doesn't really do that. It's, it's more of a way of building things than it, um, than it is a, a pure standard. Specifically, REST is very noun-oriented, where RPC-style services like SOAP tend to be very verb-oriented. So by that, I mean, you have URLs that represent things that, were, that are called resources, and you do operations on those resources, like you get them or you update them via post or put or whatever it is. Um, and so defining those URIs or the URLs is very important part of what we're talking about here. And as I mentioned, HTTP verbs get used um, as a standard way to update those resources that you're talking about. Um, and we'll go through all those in a little bit more depth. Um, this book is a really great reference if you're new to the ideas of REST. It really breaks it down into the fundamental ideas. Um, it's very short. It's, it's, about the, it's about the same thickness almost as the JavaScript bit parts. So maybe it's as good as JavaScript, I don't know. But um, it, it's a good book to read on this topic. I'm gonna, I, I tend to take a little bit more pragmatic approach. There are some people who advocate you know, transferring the entire state or the state representation back over um, HTML or something like that with hyperlinks. Uh, I prefer REST, uh, REST with JSON because it's just a little bit easier to consume, and I think most people have moved that direction. Um, but I'm going to keep a, a little bit of a pragmatic hat on. So then, what is JSON? So JSON is JavaScript Object Notation. Uh, I'm how many people have seen J JSON before? Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm guessing almost everybody, every web developer these days pretty much does it. It was invented by Douglas Crockford in the early 2000s. Uh, this is that other book that I was talking about that he wrote, JavaScript for Good Parts. 
um, and it's based on the object literal format for JavaScript. So how does, uh, how, what does JSON do compared to what came before it? So before that, everything was pretty much being done with XML um, or some sort of binary format. And JSON is a little bit different. So XML is a document-oriented format, and that has some pros and cons in that you can be very expressive with markup. Um, you can do things like transformations with uh, XSLT, do things like XPath, XQuery. But the downside is, as a document format, it doesn't necessarily map naturally onto the typical data structures that you're using in a C dialect-like language, such as JavaScript <coughs> or Python or Ruby, whatever it is, because it actually can be a little bit more expressive and you get a lot of flexibility that can actually cause you headaches. So not, it, it is very formal. You have schema definitions and namespaces with uh, defined ways for extending it. Um, but again, all that power kind of overwhelms things in some cases, and it, it makes it less readable and easy to use. Um, JSON, on the other hand, is really about data interchange. It's, um, as we said, it came from the JavaScript object notation, and as such, it very naturally maps onto the type of in-memory representations that you typically work with in a programming language, which <coughs> makes it very intuitive for programmers. It's also... Um, very human re readable and writable because it is just like with writing JavaScript objects. And, um, but it does have limitations in data types. So you know, it doesn't necessarily have a, a natural way of expressing a date or some other things. Um, there are some conventions that can be used to get around this, but, but those are limitations that you didn't quite have with XML. All right, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about um, some of the HTTP ideas and how they're used in building RESTful services. So the first thing is, um, is HTTP verbs. So what's really great about REST is, you know, when you, okay, so how many of you have kids here? All right, a few of you, I've, I've got a two-year-old. Um, if, you, if your kids are talking, or if you remember back to when your kids started talking, that, that was their first word like running or you know, exercise? You know, you know, typically it's like cup or you know, something physical. Um, when we develop a model of the world, we tend to start to think around things first and then action second. Um, and that's one of the really nice things about a RESTful architecture is you, your, your focus tends to be on designing the things, the resources, the, re, the URI structure, and then the, the actions are fairly standardized because most often what you're doing is something CRUD related, you know, creating, updating, reading, all that stuff. And with uh, HTTP based REST, you just use <coughs> like HTTP verbs to do that. So if you want to create something, that's done via the post operation. If you want to read something, that's get, which is you know what we do to get web pages every day. Update, you have two different options, patch and put, and I'll talk about the differences of those in a second, and then delete is delete. So um, pretty straightforward. Uh, there are, um, this can be limiting in some cases, and I'll talk about this in a little, uh, a little bit later. There are some technologies that have gone beyond the core HTTP verbs, such as WebDAV, that have put in additional verbs here. But the, but the fundamental idea is that we're really leveraging the HTTP verb as the action and the uh, URL, the URI, as the actual resource. So how many people here have used patch in their web services that they've built? Awesome, we've paid good job. Hopefully we've paid good job. Um, it, it's, it's a newer verb. I, don't, I believe it was actually defined in a separate RFC from the originals. Um, and it's a, I, I really like it. It's a, it doesn't have universal <coughs> and all libraries, so that can be a, a consideration as you're using it. But basically, um, I guess before I go further, I should, I should talk about this word, item potent. Um, this, can anybody define what it means? If you do something twice, it doesn't do it twice. That, that's exactly right. The, the final state is not determined by the number of times you do something. So if you you know, assuming that you just had a light switch that you could press two buttons, one was off, and you pressed off twice, the lights are off, that you're not going to go off again. That's right. um, ironically, I had a lot of trouble, I, I had a lot of trouble pronouncing this word when I first saw it, and I could never <laughs> pronounce it the same way twice, so this pronunciation is not item potent to me. Um, anyway, uh, both patch and put are item potent, uh, meaning that you can do them multiple times and, they'll do, and the final state of the resource is the same, but the difference is patch is like a partial update. Ideally, when you're doing an HTTP put, you're, def you're putting up the entire state of the resource, the object that you want it to finally exist in. And um, this is great in theory, uh, but it kind of puts a lot more effort on your clients. So um, 
in, when I'm developing web services, oftentimes my JavaScript only cares about a subset of the properties of the resource. And so when making an update to that resource, the, the uh, conceptual object, be forcing it to have, know everything about that resource to make that update is a little bit of an overhead. With patch, you only include the stuff that you actually care about updating and everything else is assumed to stay the same. And this has some important implications um, for how you design a framework that's doing patch updates because you really have to be able to differentiate nulls and not specify. And, and that's going to be something that we're going to see as a challenge in some frameworks in the, in the few minutes. Uh, I've been kind of just blowing through these initial talks uh, uh, and slides. Are there any questions so far? All right. Okay, so um, the HTTP verbs are our way of, of <coughs> defining what we're doing to a resource. HTTP status codes are kind of the way we communicate back how things went. Um, I'm, I'm guessing most of you, have, if you've been working with web pages, you've probably written uh, endpoints or whatever that return a 500 error. You know, that's, that's pretty basic. You screwed up. Um, 501, it's not implemented. The, the big ones are in here. <coughs> 200s are successes, 300s are like a redirect, and 400s are some sort of error as well as 500. So a 200 OK, you're going to return this status code if you're doing a get, a put, or a patch. Um, a 201 is uh, the response when you're creating something. So that's what we return from a post. And what you should be doing is returning the location header with that as well to give the canonical location for the resource that was created. Um, a 204 is a successful delete. It means no content. Um, I have heard some debate about using a 410 gone for some deletes, but that doesn't quite work for me because the 400s uh, are kind of more of an error code. Um, then uh, these I don't often use in my RESTful services, but sometimes you might have to have a new form. And then the ones down here, I, I always use 400 if the, if the body, the JSON body that was being posted or the query parameters that were requested are somehow not valid, either in structure or in uh, semantic meaning. You would return a 400 bad request. Uh, 403 for security, access denied type of stuff, and 404 for not found. Um, one thing about 404 that I've, that I've always had a problem with when developing services like this is um, there's two sorts of not found. There's you requested an ID that I can't find in my database, and then there's kind of the URI structure is not valid. Um, I, I don't have a, necessarily a concrete answer to how you should all these two different types of situations because often the framework that you're working with is going to return a 404 regardless. Um, but, but that's one thing that I've, I've run into and I've thought about uh, using 410. Any questions on HTTP status codes? Um, 422? 422. Uh, I'm not, I don't have to know it off the top of my head. Um, I don't know off the top of my head either. It's uh, <laughs> The server understood your request, but, but did, but it's not valid. Or but something? it's not going to do anything. Okay. Unaccessible entity. Okay, that might be a good answer to the kind of 404 versus. It's, it's right. Yeah. Oh, well, I also forgot to mention the my all-time favorite 418. I'm a T5. <laughs> so I've actually made a service that returned this. I forget why. <laughs> one, one other quick question. Um, yeah. Between 401 and 403, we I just we just had a big discussion the other day at the office about if our login credentials are invalid, do we give them a 401 or a 403? I'm not sure, and I've kind of intentionally stayed away from, I forgot to mention that early on, from the kind of authentication pieces of this, just because that's kind of a whole separate other topic to, to really deal with. Um, does anybody have a comment in terms of what they think a 401 versus a 403 for an unsuccessful login? 403 is more of an ACL. Well, a 401 would would seem to indicate that the server is maintaining some kind of state. I think. That's right. I, I guess I don't have an answer for you. So no, that's fine. fine. Uh, actually, it's what we do at Target. 401 and 403 is, is a differentiation between the authorization and the authentication. Uh, your credentials, basic credentials are invalid. So we return uh, Unauthorized 401. Right. Your credentials are valid, but you don't have access to get a particular resource. I see that. We return uh, a 401. That sounds like a very good It's an access control. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you. That's great. Cool. All right. So since we're talking about working with raw HTTP here, um, it's important. It's great to have some nice tools that are easy to work with. I've done. I've used a few <coughs> things in my career. If I'm on Windows, I really enjoy using Fiddler. Um, it lets you intercept the uh, requests that are going out, which is less important if you're doing a web browser because you can just kind of use the developer tools. But if you're doing some sort of native desktop app or something like that, it, it can actually inject itself as a proxy into, into Windows, and you can see requests and then replay them or modify them. And that was, that was one way that um, I did a lot of my uh, requests at Thomson Reuters. Uh, there's tools like Postman REST Client that are actually uh, apps in Chrome that you can use to make these requests. Uh, I, I sometimes, if it's, I'm on Unix or often on my Mac, I'll use curl um, and just use some, go straight from the command line to make my HTTP requests. And if I have time, I'll, I'll give a couple of examples at the end of the talk. Um, and then finally, honestly, the, most, the thing I do most often is since I'm already working in Python and there's you know, great libraries like the requests library, I'll just actually write the code and, and kind of test things out that way and you're kind of um, it's a lot easier to consume the data and then make multiple successive calls to test things out when you're working in a language like that. All right, so now I'm going to move on to the sort of concrete example that I want to talk through and code a few different times. Um, basically, it's a generic sports, and this maybe isn't the crowd for a sports analogy, but uh, or a sports example, that's what we're going to do. It's very simple, it's just teams and players. So a team has multiple players. Um, the team has a name, a mascot, and a set of colors, and the player uh, is related to a team and has uh, a name and a position. So, uh, so what does our URL structure look like for here? Um, this is the, what I've kind of defined. These are the resources that I've defined for this example. Um, I'll talk a little bit later that this might not be the best way to do this. If you, know, if you want to consider players to be the best <coughs> player in the world, that could be associated with different teams or change teams, but I'm going to assume they're related to one team. Um, first, for a get on v1 slash teams, that will return all teams that are in the system. We, we won't support any filtering or anything fancy like that. Hosting to v1 teams is going to create a new team. Get to uh, v1 teams and then a team ID will retrieve a team. Similarly, so that same URL puts or patch will update it, delete or delete it. Um, and then from within a team, we uh, have a set of players. You can get all players for that team. And in this particular case, we're actually going to be real fancy, and you can filter by a career parameter position if you only want certain players of a position there. To create a new player, you go post, um, get a specific player by player ID and team ID, and the same for updates and deletes. So we do this That, that's honestly one of the challenges that I've, uh, that I've run into with REST is things like copies from one place to another. What you often end up doing is doing a get and a put. Um, when I worked at Thompson, this, we ran into this problem a lot, is that you, it would take multiple successive calls to accomplish something in order to kind of keep this simplified metaphor. Um, and in some, that, that kind of breaks transactional guarantees as well, which can also be a challenge. So that's one of the bigger challenges um, when dealing with the REST architecture. One thing I would, I, I'll kind of talk about in my wrap up is being pragmatic sometimes. Um, so one thing you'll notice that we, we said that REST is very noun oriented and generally a way to tell that you're doing RESTful URI structures is that you have nouns here and not verbs. So if, if you're doing it, you can still do JSON based ser HTTP services that are RPC style by having verbs like you know, maybe it's get teams or something like that. Um, you could, uh, one of the ways that you can get around that if it's really important a performance consideration for your application is I would sometimes make uh, a slash copy team. It's, it's kind of a hack, but it, it, you have to, sometimes you just have to do what you have to do. And that's so, so we know we try to do the crap function, but that's where the puristic rest type comes and says, this is wrong. Right. So there's nothing like a right way of doing it. We just need to do this. So I just want this question. What do you, how do you solve the problem? Yep, that, that, that's one way that you could solve it. Um, kind of like I said, in my ideal world, you can inject additional HTTP verbs and do that, but then you sometimes run into problems where um, you're, you know, if you're using Tomcat or whatever, maybe they don't support the ability to dynamically have different HTTP verbs or something like that. So um, that, that would be another way of, of solving the problem. All right, 
right. So um, I'm not going to focus on NDB uh, and kind of the App Engine data store, but this is just the structure that our, our different models have. We've got name as a string, colors as a uh, basically a list of strings, mascot as a string for player, name as a uh, team is just a key, or just think of it as an ID property to the team, and uh, name is a string, and position is a string. And that maps to this, uh, this JSON structure that we would send back and forth. Now, for the IDs, I'm just using the NDB key as a URL safe value uh, for the sake of this example. All right, so the first example that I'm gonna do is uh, JSON in Web App 2. And I'll start off with just one slide to show something that, that I ended up having to do. So I, I mentioned patch and that not all these HTTP methods are supported in all your framework. This is an example of a problem where I ran into that. I actually, uh, for our Docs application, at least with the version of Web App 2 that we're using, we actually have to add patch as an acceptable verb in there. So um, uh, this is just kind of a, a prerequisite to getting this up and running. And I'm going to try to switch into code here. when you have multiple examples that look almost identical. <laughs> uh, this is uh, PyCharm. Definitely recommend it if you're doing Python development. It's cool to even have say, its own uh, presentation, which is, which is really cool. Okay, so, whoa, scroll fast, scroll fast. Um, this is hard to read. Okay, so this is, uh, the first thing that we have to do is we have to define the endpoints that we're doing, and it, it it's just straight web app too. So if you're familiar with that, you already know what you're doing. But if you're not, it's uh, you just you give it a list of routes, and you can do things like route prefixes, which I haven't I have done in here. But you give it the URL, which is kind of a not quite a regular expression, but sort of. It accepts a certain syntax like this to tell it that this is actually a, a value that's going to be filled in with some sort of string value, and then you can optionally specify which methods each endpoint is going to be accepting. Um, this is one way of doing it. The other way that you can do it is you can actually have your handlers have uh, methods literally named get, put, post, and that sort of thing. And it'll automatically do that mapping for you. I, I like this style where I explicitly specify it in here because then you can just look at this block of code, see all your endpoints, and, and you're going to go from there. You then have to uh, map it onto a handler. and so it's module dot handler and then optionally colon method to call. If you're using the method where the HTTP verb is your method name, then you obviously wouldn't have this. But I prefer um, explicitly specifying that. And then you just give it a name in case you want to uh, use it to generate a URI later in your code. Okay, all right. So let's. Team Handler. The Team Handler is going to derive from Web App 2 that request handler, and then we just got the different methods uh, that we, we had shown in our URIs before. So get teams, and a uh, pretty simple operation. We're just querying NDB uh, data store for all the teams that exist there. Um, what we're doing is we're building up uh, sort of JavaScript or not JavaScript Python primitive objects that we're then going to call just the JSON library to dump those to raw JSON for us. So um, this is what I was talking about when I'm saying raw approach to it. We're not leveraging any sort of library. We're just basically generating dictionaries of strings and integers <coughs> and lists of them to generate the data structure that comes back. And the meat of that work is done in this team to dict function. Um, so one of the problems that you run into frequently with your um, with your code, when, no matter how you're really doing this, is you're really gonna um, you're, you have some sort of message objects that you're using to communicate down to the client. You have your models either in NDB or some sort of raw, uh, you know, in a SQL database or whatever that is, and you're doing some sort of conversion. Um, in this case, we're being you know we're, we're obviously very close to the metal. Um, one way that you can do this if you're using dicts is uh, NDB has a two dict method that can kind of help you do that conversion. Um, I, I don't find it ideal, especially because I don't. This isn't the way I end up doing most of my coding anyway. 
Um, but you, you lose a lot of control over things, and you're kind of trusting that the, the actual structure is always going to remain the same, even if you know you, you end up changing something in your NDB data storage. It kind of makes it challenging with your with maintaining data contracts. But I wanted to just throw it out here as an example. Um, also, we have the ID field, and that's not going to come back here in the way we'd expect. It just kind of strips off the ones that don't make sense. So I, we have to, after we kind of get that dictionary, we add the ID field, which, as I said, is just the URL uh, safe version of the key to the T. Um, the other way that you can kind of do this, and this is what I would typically do more often myself, um, I, I almost always create this sort of x to y methods and then y to x to go the opposite directions for updates. And most often what I would do is I would just create a dictionary literal and set all the properties that I want because then the data contract that you're sending down to your uh, down to your service becomes much more explicit and you can kind of control that and read it. Honestly, that's one of the biggest challenges um, that I've found with, uh, with this type of approach when you, with using dictionaries being passed back is it's really hard to see what the data contract is. And that's what we're going to see that the Google Cloud Endpoints library helps out with a lot because it, it, it makes this contract much more explicit. All right, so uh, we basically build up a <coughs> list of dictionaries. We then set the content type on our response to application JSON. We write the response JSON, and by default, our status code is going to be 200. So that's all there is to doing that, that endpoint. Um, any questions on any of the flow that happened there? Jason is done in those cases, but um, really, what you're going to have to most of what you're going to have to do is, is some sort of explicit code to do the checks on, on, on the contract. So that's, that's pretty much what it comes down to, and especially value based checks. If you're talking like this number has to be between five and ten or something, that's going to have to be some sort of code base. Now, you could um, one thing that I've done very uh, that's been very helpful is I'll, I'll define that. Um, annotations on, on certain methods. So it doesn't so much work when you're working in the dict world that get, that, and explicitly grabbing things off of the request.body and stuff. But as we see more things getting injected into our methods, you can use annotations to help do some validations. All right, so uh, the create team method, uh, a little bit more meat here. Uh, the big things that we want to take a look at are we're, we're grabbing, so as if you recall, this is a post that's going to have a JSON body. So I just read off the body, parse it with JSON. I'm getting a dictionary here. And here's my method of going the opposite direction. Um, it, uh, it, it actually sets a, uh, creates a model object if you don't pass one in. So it, it, this is coming out as an NDB object, and I save it. Um, I'm not really doing much validation here. And as we were talking about, that's kind of a challenge in this mode. You know this uh, <coughs> this bot, this thing could come back and have a, a you know hundred different properties that are completely invalid. We're not really checking any of that stuff, um, but there's not a lot you can do, you do automatically. You have to you have to do real hard validation. I am just, if it is bad JSON, and so this would uh, this would throw like a value there. I am um, raising a web app two exception for each to be a bad request, which would set the 400 status code. Um, finally, I, I mentioned when you're doing a create, you want to set that location header, and I'm calling into the Web App 2 library to actually uh, um, get that URL by telling, giving, it, giving it the name of the hand, um, endpoint I'm interested in and giving it the parameters it needs to fill it out. Um, and then finally, setting the status code to 201 to indicate that something was created. All right. So, getting a team. So this one, uh, this one's the first method that we've seen where the, the parameters actually provided coming into the into the handler method. This is coming out of that URL, if you recall. So Web App Two will automatically parse that out for you and pass it in as a as a parameter. Um, I created a little bit of a helper method that will try to load up based on the ID. 
and it'll raise a, a, an exception for the 404 if something goes wrong there. But other than that, um, it <coughs> this is uh, this is the update. So other than that, it's just kind of doing the same thing as the post. It's calling this set, only it's passing in the existing model object to do that instead of creating one new and updating it. But this at this point, I kind of uh, because the next one is updated, I kind of. And they're really just the same thing, except how you implement this method right here. I just want to kind of talk to you what the differences might be if you're supporting patch versus post. So if you're support when you're supporting, um, not patch versus post, put versus post. So if you're supporting put, remember you're supposed to be taking the exact representation from the client and setting it to your to your model. So basically, what I'm doing is from that dictionary, I'm just getting all the properties that I care about. And either I could throw an exception if they didn't exist, that would be one way, or I'm just assuming that they're none or a blank value otherwise. So this would mean that if uh, the client called without colors, colors on, that, on, on your resource would be set to no colors, or the name would be set to none if that was omitted. And that's not necessarily what, the, what they would have intended to do. And so that's where the patch comes in. <coughs> so that in, this, in this version of the method, uh, Instead of just blindly grabbing that values out of the dictionary, instead we check to see if they specified that at all. So it's possible that they put the uh, none for name, but the but name would still be in the dictionary if that was the case. So we can we can better understand the intent of the caller and only do those partial updates if uh, if they actually intended to update those values. Is there are there any questions between the difference between how to, how you would do an update from put versus patch? Just wondering when did the when did patch come along and, and why? Um, just because I've looked at a lot of specs that have been designed, and haven't seen that, so I'm just curious. Um, about I the, think it was like 2010 ish, that, 2008 somewhere in there. Okay. Yeah. And is it is it in widespread use at this point? I mean, it's getting better. So the latest version. So when I was at Thompson, there was like one version of Tomcat that didn't support it, and then the newer. This is like three years ago, mm -hmm. and then the newer versions were starting to support it. At this point, I think most of the modern web frameworks support it either directly or by allowing you to kind of say it, this is an acceptable verb to come in, sort of a thing. Um, there was, there might have, uh, I believe all versions of Internet Explorer support it, but somebody could um, correct me if I'm wrong there. So it, it's becoming more broadly used. And why it was created is exactly for this problem, because as you start to define these services and really try to stick to a pure meaning of what they're supposed to be, this is a much more convenient way to interact with the service than it is if you have to kind of put that whole resource in. Because what, what I would end up doing sometimes if I had to do that whole, put the whole resource, what I end up doing is I do a get right before and then, then a put. And you're still, if not, there's no transactional guarantees to mention right. that. And if you don't care about a property, why, why would you risk changing? Any other questions? No question. Yeah. Couldn't you just do a, a put and omit values? My understanding of how the spec of how they're supposed they're supposed to be defined is that you're supposed to specify everything and what happens when they're omitted. I'm not sure. The patch is, is kind of clear on that that the intention is if it's omitted to do nothing. So how you actually I mean you know you're building the service. So you um, honestly what I did for for some of the um, I built this content management system in Java on uh, Tom, Tom, Tomcat server sort of thing. And what I did is I implemented put with patch semantics. Like exactly what you're talking about, and I was just clear in the documentation that that's what I'm doing. Again, getting back to being more pragmatic than you know, purist. It, 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 there's nothing to say you can't do anything with any of the verbs. <laughs> Free world. Um, okay. So uh, I'm not going to go through the whole spiel with. Uh, I guess I forgot the leads, but hopefully that should be pretty self-explanatory. You know, you're just getting the idea and you're looking it up um, and you're executing the delete. You, because delete, um, in my mind, and maybe somebody disagrees with me here, is again another item potent operation. I don't throw an error if I get an invalid key. I'm just like, okay, it was previously deleted or something. Great. Let's move on. So, so delete only because it's a delete. So, uh, it depends on. <coughs> 
That, that's a great question. The question was, how do I do? How do you do a soft delete? So it, um, at Docalytics, we do a, that. We almost exclusively do soft deletes for our data, just to make sure we don't mess something up. Um, I typically, most often, when I uh, implement soft deletes, I make it so that the client has no con has no concept of the fact that it's deleted. So it, it still exists in the data store, but the client has no way of accessing it after that point. In which case, I implement the delete method for that. If it's a case where my client has an awareness that something is soft deleted, then I would probably use a patch or a, a put to, and have a property for soft deleters. That's a great question. All right, so the only thing I really wanted to point out in the implementation for players here is that um, some of these URLs include both a player ID and a team ID. And just by implementation detail of how I've chosen to design the NDB data model, I don't really need the team ID to get the uh, player ID. I, I could have made it sort of a sub-entity, I guess, and that would have required both. But I do still want to maintain the semantics of my URL, so I, I do check to make sure the team exists if they're requesting something so that they can't be mishmashing things, which could possibly indicate that either something malicious was happening or um, just the client's really confused. All right, so that's the main stuff that I wanted to talk about on the, uh, the sort of raw web app two side of things. Are there any closing questions on on that? So the only controversial thing in the rest is you said that to get a team player, you can get a portion ID, which might say the team player, team player who is probably <coughs> sequenced as a second player, but a portion seven. So how do you consider whether the second argument is portion or the team ID? So you're asking, how, in what cases would you have the team ID and the player in the yeah. URL? Or so you're trying to get from the team, from the team A, a team, team player, who is probably a portion number seven. Mm -hmm. a so the seventh player yeah. on the team? It's not the seventh player. He, he could be a second player, but he's a portion seven. I would say he's taking so. In soccer, and the okay. When, when the team gets oh, the position started. stuff. You're right. I, I forgot to I forgot to talk about that in here. Maybe I'll just jump in. So I think the question is regarding filtering. Um, <coughs> get players. Okay. So here we go. So um, so I mentioned that we are, we're adding a little bit more smarts on the get players for a team endpoint. That you can specify a query parameter for. Um, for filtering, and, and that's kind of, it. Kind of brings up an important point because, again, you know, we're building these services. We can use anything for anything. And it, what do you use query parameters for versus URL parameters for versus headers or what, what all that? Um, generally, the way that REST goes is query parameters are are I forget how exactly they phrase this, but they're used as ways to define how the processing should happen. So they're used for things like filters, how a search should be executed. Um, if it's actually related to the identity of the resource, that would be a URL component of that resource. So, so things that identify the thing that you're going after are part of the URL. Computational related stuff are query parameters. Here, the position is the query parameter. And how we grab that is just we um, access the get dictionary that's coming in on the request. If the, play, if the position is set, we just filter our players to that. So I think that is kind of yeah, good. Query parameters will be used as a non-mandatory thing that get your players data. Right. In some cases, you could require some query parameters, I would think. Um, but yes, if they're there, you use them. All right. Okay. All right, so Google Cloud endpoints. Um, so, before we kind of show the, the code and how Google Cloud Endpoints, I just want to talk about what I think Google's objectives were when they created Cloud Endpoints. So, uh, from kind of just reading their marketing documentation and watching some of their presentations, what they really seem to, who they really seem to be targeting with Cloud Endpoints were mobile app developers who needed some sort of back end but didn't necessarily want to spend a ton of cycles on building that. They wanted a way to quickly build that and spin it up in a scalable way. So that, you know, obviously App Engine has all the scalability capabilities. But what's really cool about Cloud Endpoints 
is that you're, we're actually going to write endpoints in a way that's kind of similar to what we just saw, but we're going to be using all sorts of annotations and formal data contracts, and using that meta information that we create, <coughs> you can actually generate client libraries for a variety of platforms, including Java for Android, um, Objective-C for iOS, and JavaScript for the browser. So, um, so it's, it's really kind of a neat way to automatically generate libraries. Uh, going back to my experience at Thompson, we did something very similar, only it was Java instead of Python. We used annotations and we had a whole code generator that could generate uh, at least some of the libraries that would consume those services, which can be a huge time saver. Um, another cool thing, since you have a lot of meta information around, is they created this API Explorer. So when you create your services, it, um, you can use the API Explorer to see all of them and then you can actually execute them right in the browser without writing any code. So this is kind of an alternative to that raw HTTP stuff that's going on. You can just, uh, you can just do it right here. Another thing that I should mention about Cloud Endpoints is it's built on Google Protobufs, 